The wind whips through the canyons here in the American Southwest, and there's no one to hear it but us. A reminder of the 40,000 generations of thinking men and women who preceded us, about whom we know next to nothing, upon whom our society is based. When our prehistoric ancestors studied the sky after sunset, they observed that some of the stars were not fixed with respect to the constant pattern of the constellations. Instead, five of them moved slowly forward across the sky, then backward for a few months, then forward again, as if they couldn't quite make up their minds. We call them planets, the Greek word for wanderer. These planets presented a profound mystery. The earliest explanation was that they were living beings. How else explain their strange, looping behavior? Later, they were thought to be gods, and then disembodied astrological influences. But the real solution to this particular mystery is that the planets are worlds, that the Earth is one of them, and that they all go around the sun according to precise mathematical laws. This discovery has led directly to our modern global civilization. The merging of imagination with observation produced an exact description of the solar system. Only then could you answer the fundamental question, the one at the root of modern science, what makes it all go? 2,000 years ago, no such question would even have been asked. The prevailing view had then been formulated by Claudius Ptolemy, an Alexandrian astronomer and also the preeminent astrologer of his time. Ptolemy believed that the Earth was at the center of the universe, that the sun and the moon and the planets like Mars went around the Earth. It's the most natural idea in the world. The Earth seems steady, solid, immobile while we can see the heavenly bodies rising and setting every day. But then how explain the loop-the-loop -loop motion of the planets in the sky, Mars, for example? This little machine shows Ptolemy's model. The planets were imagined to go around the Earth, attached to perfect crystal spheres, but not attached directly to the spheres, but indirectly through a kind of off-center wheel. The sphere turns, the little wheel rotates, and as seen from the Earth, Mars does its loop-the-loop. -loop. This model permitted reasonably accurate predictions of planetary motion, where a planet would be on a given day. Certainly good enough predictions for the precision of measurement in Ptolemy's time and much later. Supported by the church through the Dark Ages, Ptolemy's model effectively prevented the advance of astronomy for 1,500 years. Finally, in 1543, a quite different explanation of the apparent motion of the planets was published by a Polish cleric named Nicholas Copernicus. Its most daring feature was the proposition that the sun, not the Earth, was at the center of the universe. The Earth was demoted to just one of the planets. The retrograde or loop-to-loop -loop motion happens as the Earth overtakes Mars in its orbit. You can see that from the standpoint of the Earth, Mars is now going slightly backwards, and now it is going in its original direction. This Copernican model worked at least as well as Ptolemy's crystal spheres. But it annoyed an awful lot of people. The Catholic Church later put Copernicus's work on its list of forbidden books. And Martin Luther described Copernicus in these words. He said, people give ear to an upstart astrologer. This fool wishes to reverse the entire science of astronomy. Close quote. The confrontation between the two views of the cosmos, Earth-centered and Sun-centered, reached its climax with a man who, like Ptolemy, was both an astronomer and an astrologer. He 
He lived in a time when the human spirit was fettered and the mind chained, when angels and demons and crystal spheres were imagined up there in the skies. Science still lacked the slightest notion of physical laws underlying nature. But the brave and lonely struggle of this man was to provide the spark that ignited the modern scientific revolution. Johannes Kepler was born in Germany in 1571. He was sent to the Protestant seminary school in the provincial town of Malbrun to be educated for the clergy. It was a strict, disciplined life, up before dawn to begin a long day of prayer and study. This was the age of the Reformation. Malbrun was a kind of educational and ideological boot camp, training young Protestants in the use of theological weaponry against the fortress of Roman Catholicism. There was little reassurance or comfort here for a sensitive boy like Kepler. He was intelligent and he knew it. That, together with his stubbornness and his fierce independence, served to isolate him from the other boys. Kepler made few friends in his two years at Malbrun. So he kept to himself, withdrawn into the world of his own thoughts, which were often concerned with his imagined unworthiness in the eyes of God. He despaired of ever attaining salvation. But God to him was more than punishment. God was also the creative power of the universe. And the young Kepler's curiosity about God was even greater than his fear. He wanted to know God's plan for the world. He wanted to read the mind of God. This was his obsession. It was to inspire all his great achievements. It was to take him and Europe out of the cloister of medieval thought. <laughs> 